Today's video was inspired by a question that showed up in my comment section. The comment came from N17Hero and was, paraphrasing slightly, Hi Jago, I'd love to see a video about why the tube is so top heavy. You have lines stretching into Hertfordshire, Buckinghamshire and Essex, and yet south of the river, lines fizzle out, still well within the bounds of Greater London. Now this is an interesting question, not least because I myself live in South London. It is true to say that the underground is indeed far more extensive north of the Thames than south. There are 250 stations north of the river, and by the time this video comes out, 31 south. Five of the 11 tube lines don't venture south of the river at all. But why? Well, this question is one with several answers, geographical, political and economic. I'm going to try not to be too boring here. So first of all, the question we need to ask is why even build an underground railway? They're expensive and they always come with engineering challenges. Well, two reasons. Land in central London is very, very pricey. When the first underground lines were built, London was already a very built-up city. The early lines were built using a method known as cut and cover, where they dig a trench, lay the track and cover it over again. Wherever possible, these lines were built to follow the line of the streets to minimise the number of private buildings they'd have to buy and demolish. But still, it was a pretty costly process, and the completion of the district line was delayed for years due to financial issues. From 1890 onwards, lines were built at a deeper level, where they could follow any course they liked and not have to demolish much of anything. The second reason was political. In 1846, the Royal Commission on Metropolitan Railway Termini had made it the law that you couldn't build railways in central London. Not without going through a lengthy parliamentary consultation at any rate. Underground railways were different. They created far less disturbance to the fabric of the city, so it was far easier to get them authorised. Therefore, it was the way forward, and continues to be even to this day. Meanwhile, south of the river, land was cheaper, the area was on the whole much poorer. The Royal Commission's recommendations did cover south of the river, but to a far lesser extent, and this brings up another point. If you look at an underground map, there's very little south of the river. If you look at a map that includes railway routes as well, things are a lot more even. South London has an abundance of railways in places, even a surfeit. There were four major railway companies behind this, the London and South Western, the London Brighton and South Coast, the London Chatham and Dover, and the South Eastern. Britain's southern railway companies tended to embrace commuter transport far more than the northern ones. They didn't have as much heavy freight, so they filled their coffers with passenger revenue. The London Chatham and Dover and the South Eastern Railway were deadly rivals, which caused them to build lines and stations in direct competition with each other, in this bizarre game of train-based one-upmanship. There were also the trams. Trams were big in South London due to cheap fares. So when the underground was being built, getting south of the river was not a priority. So that explains why there are so many underground lines in central London and so few in south London, but what about further out? The original comment specifically mentioned that Amersham, which is some way northwest of London, has an underground station, while, say, Weybridge does not. This is indeed rather incongruous. The northern end of the Metropolitan Line serves a number of towns that aren't in London, like Amersham, Chesham and Watford. And that's because the Metropolitan Line started out as the Metropolitan Railway. The Metropolitan Railway wasn't intended to be an underground line. In fact, when it opened in 1863, the concept of an underground line didn't even exist. The Metropolitan Railway saw itself as a proper mainline railway that just happened to have an underground section. In fact, their largest locomotives couldn't even go underground. And if places like Amersham and Chesham seem far out, the Metropolitan used to go further. The furthest reach was a place called Verney Junction, 50 miles from Baker Street. How far flung was it? Well, Verney isn't a place. They just named the station Verney Junction after one of the directors because there was nothing nearby to name it after. Why build a junction in the middle of nowhere? Because their long-term plan was to get to Oxford. 
There was even a mad idea to run trains up to Manchester and down to Paris, but that's a whole other story. When the Metropolitan was absorbed into the underground in 1933, its directors protested vigorously, but to no avail. The London Underground quickly got rid of the furthest reaches of the Metropolitan, but kept everything else. These were the days before Greenbelt legislation limited the growth of London, so perhaps London Underground figured they'd become part of London eventually. So, long story short, the reason places like Amersham have underground stations is largely due to railway politics. It's just the way the dice fell. But okay, what about the easternmost reaches of the Central Line? Those aren't in London either. Well, that's due to the new works programme proposed in 1935. This involved taking over a number of already existing railway lines, electrifying them, and adding them to the underground. The lines chosen were ones that could, with relative ease, be linked up to the underground lines that were already there. Lines in the west and the east that could be connected to the central line. Lines in the north that could be connected to the northern line. Actually, the northern line is only called the northern line because of those extensions. And it was originally hoped that it would go all the way to Bushy Heath. All this only happened north of the river. Because north of the river was the place that had all the underground lines. So... There were underground lines north of the river because there were underground lines north of the river. How informative. The underground has evolved over the years. When the Metropolitan Railway was built, the concept of urban mass transit was in its infancy. Now an underground line is a very different beast from a surface railway, although systems like Thameslink and the Overground are a bit of a grey area between the two. So for a long time now, people in South London have been asking, why can't we have a tube line? Well, another big factor preventing lines being built south of the river is simple geology. The soil in central London is mostly clay. The soil south of the river is full of sand, silt, the odd deposit of peat, and even seashells. Like me in this video, it's not very coherent, and so it's difficult to build a tunnel through. With modern tunnelling techniques, it is a bit easier though, hence the Victoria and Jubilee Line extensions into South London. But again, politics come into it. The early lines, which I'm defining here as everything built before 1933, were funded by private investment on the expectation that they'd make money, which mostly they did not. These days, Transport for London is expected to fund itself, or it relies on grants from the Greater London Authority. One exception was the Jubilee Line extension, which was partially funded by business interests in Canary Wharf in the 1990s. They knew the line itself wasn't going to make a profit, but good transport links would make Canary Wharf a much more attractive place for companies to set up shop. London Transport agreed to a partnership on condition that they could add stations in places like Bermondsey and Canada Water, in South London. As for other schemes in South London, well, it doesn't look good. In the wake of Covid, the Bakerloo Line extension into South East London has been put on hold and the local authorities have considered doing away with it altogether and building a tram line instead, which would be much cheaper. And maybe that's the point we really need to think about. South London is light on tube lines, but it's got the DLR, the Thames Link, the Overground, the Tram Link, and, lest we forget, lots and lots of railways. Hello all, I hope you enjoyed this top-heavy tale from the tube. If you did, then head south to the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Thanks to N17Hero for asking the question that inspired this video. Thanks also to my donors on Kofi and Patreon, you are the tramline to my old Kent Road. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.